I'm pleased to present David Lindo. David is the urban birder. He um, has kept, he's been captivated by birds since he was a child and has been able to turn a hobby into a career. Um, today, he's known as the urban birder and he's on a mission to get everyone, particularly city dwellers, better engaged with the nature around us through the medium of birds. David is a broadcaster, writer, speaker, educator, and bird tour leader. And in addition to the resources available on his website, theurbanburger.com, he has written countless articles on urban birds, urban conservation and wildlife, um, generally for many websites, publications, and magazines. He's also penned the forewords to several books, as well as written several books of his own, including The Urban Birder, Tales from Concrete Jungles, Urban Birding, and his most recent book, How to Be an Urban Birder. He's a regular TV and radio presenter and has been featured on the BBC, ITV, Channel 4 in the UK, as well as other TV and radio channels around the world, including CBS here in the United States. And he was recently named as the, most, the, the seventh most influential person in wildlife in, in BBC Wildlife Magazine. Included in his many roles and accolades, he is a fellow of the International League of Conservation Writers, a member of the British Guild of Travel Writers, and is founder of the Tower 42 Bird Study Group and Britain's Boat National Bird Campaign. So um, let me see if I can shift our screen viewing back to, to David. Let me stop. And let's see if we can highlight you, David. Um, okay, so David, I thought I would start by asking you a few questions. It, it's, it's an honor to have you here today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have you join us. And um, given the fact that a, a number of our participants have expressed a desire to connect with nature and to tap back into their childhood sense of wonder, I wonder if you'd be willing to start us off by sharing a bit about yourself with people who may not be familiar with you, but also how did you develop your love of birding and, and how does wonder connect with that? Okay, uh, firstly, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Because I hear a terrible echo. But anyway, thank you, Stormy, very much for a, allowing me in on this program. Apologies for being late again and what have you. And also to let you know that the, the website to go to actually is, is not the urbanbirder.com, it's the urbanbirderworld.com because I want to make it big, the urbanbirderworld.com. And I've got lots of stuff on there um, to help people get engaged with nature. Um, in terms of your question, well, um, my interest in natural history, um, I think, was with me before I was born. I often say that I think, in fact, I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced that I was a puma in a previous life. And I was, uh, I remember, I don't remember, but I think <laughs> I was hunting birds towards the end of my time as a puma. And I think I missed one and it flew off and I thought, oh, that looks absolutely amazing, the way it flies and its plumage. So I decided to become a birding puma. Uh, which led to my demise because I wasn't eating. But I thought, this is interesting. Maybe I can move this on to my next life. And luckily, I was born as a human being in northwest London in my next life. So that was good news. So I had this innate interest, which um, no one else around me shared. I mean, I didn't have any friends, family, or anyone that had the same interest as me. Um, and quite weirdly, I kind of developed it myself, and I taught myself. I didn't have a mentor, so I taught myself, and by the age of eight, I was really kind of fascinated by the different varieties of birds to be found, and I, I discovered a book. Oh, there you are, Stormzy. Stormy, even. Um, I, 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 um, <laughs> I, I discovered this book in the library, and I read every single page. It had over a thousand species of birds to be found in Britain, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. And I was so, it was like finding the Holy Scriptures. Scriptures. I was thinking, whoa! And I read every single, every single page. I knew every single species. I knew all their scientific names, where they came from. And that's where my wonder came from, because I just thought, wow, there's such a variety of different things. And I was watching these, some of these birds, very few of them actually, from my back garden window. And um, 
I think over the years and to this day, I just find I just find watching birds so um, therapeutical for me. And also, I just I mean to be honest, I'm in England. It's a cold, windy day here in in southern England, and I'm in quarantine because I've just come from Spain. I've got to spend two weeks indoors. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. Even if there's a van outside with darkened windows and aerials sticking out the top of it looking for me to make sure I don't escape, I think I might have to do so just to get out and to, to see something because um, I find it hard not to spend a day without being able to, to look up, basically. Um, during the pandemic, I was in Spain. Some of you may know this. And I was in their draconian lockdown, which meant that I couldn't go out for two months. Um, but luckily, I had a terrace and I could see some birds uh, flying over or some birds on the rooftops, but there was no green anywhere. And it was quite interesting because I was brought back to the beginning again. I was brought back to my very essence, which was just to be grateful to see anything. And when I did see it, just to, to watch it. And it was interesting watching starlings, or down there they've got the spotless starling, and watching a particular male on a a TV aerial and he was singing his heart out and I was there with him and then one day he attracted a female and I was there with him in fact he attracted several some of them didn't want to know but one of them did and I was there with him and then he mated I wasn't quite there with him but I understood and then later on I seen him with food in his mouth so I saw the whole process and it was fabulous to know that that was the, the one that bird was the one bird the whole time. It wasn't several birds. It was one particular bird. And that connection was, was one of the things that helped me mentally get through this very sort of dark period of time. And for me, that's, that, that, that's what it's all about. You know, I, I've told Stormy before, and I'm sure some of you already know, uh, Michelle and Gloria totally know this about what I feel and that is it's not about ticking off lists and stuff it's a very spiritual experience it's it's the connectivity which makes me you know I thought about the other day I thought what do I enjoy about bird watching you know what I enjoy I enjoy how it makes me feel not actually so much seeing the bird it's how it makes me feel you know how we can get excited and then I've got a couple of feeders I put up on the window here because I was thinking I just need to see something and the day I see something, I'll be so excited to be untrue. So it, it is more about that connection than it is about ticking a box. Fantastic. Yes, I, I agree. The connection is critical. And um, I appreciate you bringing up the, the, the kind of the life cycle of these birds, right, and being able to watch them and, and see them progress over time. That's such a, an important thing. And I don't think we often experience that unless we're able or in a position to watch from day to day how things progress. Um, so building on this idea of ticking off a list, I, I'm curious. Um, I read in an article recently that you were quoted as saying, people are brought up thinking birds are hard to see or they're only in rural areas or you need to be an expert to identify them. What does urban birding allow that our traditional ideas of birding do not? And what equipment or knowledge does someone need in order to engage in urban birding? I think what urban birding allows is the ability to see all those birds that you thought lived in the country actually in an urban environment. And by that, I mean, for example, in the UK, there's been 620 different species of bird ever recorded since records, records began. And they include tide line corpse of a species that's only been found once through to birds that are in your garden the whole time. And of that, that list, maybe 95% have turned up in, in urban areas, which means that anything can turn up anywhere at any time. And I remember when I was a child and I was told all the time that you need to be out in the countryside and I had no one to take me. So I became an urban birder without realizing. And I would spend hours upon hours upon hours staring out my, my, my bedroom window into my backyard. And over the years, the amount of species I saw, which I thought 
hey, that's in my book. The illustration is by a countryside, you know, vista. Yeah, here it is in my garden. And I realized that these things actually occur everywhere. It's just that we compartmentalize things all the time and think they're only found there, they're only found here, they're only found there. It's like when you go to a nature reserve and you go to a preserve and people say to you, here's a list of what's seen. And I'm thinking, well, okay, that's a list, but that's fine. But anything can turn up. And I think it's about keeping your mind open um, to the possibilities. Um, the second half of your question was, What do people need to be an urban birder? And equipment, right. supplies, knowledge, what helps? Okay, what you need, you don't need knowledge, number one. That's, that's not important. Knowledge comes, and knowledge comes at whatever pace you want it to come. You could remain someone who just watches backyard birds and calls them as you see them, or you, think you could become some amazing ornithologist who travels the world. Whatever, whatever, whatever floats your boat as far as I'm concerned. I think one of the biggest pieces of equipment you need is your open mind. I think that once your mind is open and it's switched onto the wavelength that nature occurs, then all possibilities can occur. And then to fine tune that, a pair of binoculars and a book to help you identify stuff if you wish. But certainly, you know, if you want to get closer or see things in more detail, then a pair of binoculars would be a good idea. But again, it's, you know, people make a big thing about having to learn the names and having to know what turns up where and all that sort of stuff. And I, I don't think that's so important the first time around. It's like when you listen to the dawn chorus or if you listen to a lot of birds singing, don't kill yourself, don't sort of beat yourself up because you can't identify on the all the individual singers. Just listen to it as if it's a piece of music. It's orchestral music and you're hearing the, the cello and then you're hearing the, the uh, trombone. You know, you just hear bits and pieces and then after a while you begin to pick them out. I think there's too much emphasis on, I have to know this by tomorrow. No, it's all about making yourself feel good. And I think it's got, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's about being out and feeling good, that's the most important thing you need to have and to feel before anything else, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, here's a question. Given that everybody will be spending some time in nature or viewing nature, um, one of the things that, that I think is helpful to encourage is a shift in perspective. And, and when we last talked, <clears throat> you told me that you suggest to people that they think about the environment as a bird would. Can you please talk a little bit about that? What does that mean? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about people, you know, what to expect, what sort of birds to expect. And when I talk to people about urban birding, they often say, oh, there's nothing here. It's just pigeons and sparrows. Or why do you want to go there? You know, I remember being in Israel. I was in um, Elat. And I was sitting in this park occupied by drunks. Um, you know, it looks like a normal park. And a guy came up to me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching birds. You don't need to watch birds here. There's no birds here. You need to go to the bird watching centre outside of town. That's where the birds are. And I said, well, actually, there's a lot of things here. Look, over there, there's this and there's that. Because you just have to think to yourself that I'm looking at a bush and that bush actually, even if it's in the middle of Cleveland or wherever you are, in a busy area, that bush contains shelter, food, and that's all a need. So if you can open your mind and think to yourself, if I was, you know, if I was a, an eastern bluebird on migration, I would be in this type of bush feeding on those berries in the autumn, in, in the fall. So if you think that way, then you start seeing birds actually using those habitats. And I've seen it so many times in my travels where you are somewhere. Can you hear me, by the way, because you've all gone weird. Are oh, you back now? Yeah. Um, you, you kind of you, you think about things. And I, I've always seen this in, in that I've been out with people who show me their urban habitats and they say, oh, we don't get anything special ever turning up. And then the next minute they say to me, 
oh, I've never seen that here before. And part of that is because they don't expect to see it, so therefore they don't see it. And for me, any habitat, even if it's you know, a, a, a river that's polluted. I mean, I've been in cities like Manchester in England where in the centre of town there's this really horrible river that has uh, shopping carts in there and people throw soda and stuff in there and there's pollution. Yet if you look, you might see a sandpiper or you might see a wagtail because these, these birds still manage to find some kind of, 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 you know, something there to feed on at least. So I always keep my mind open. I always think to myself that even if I'm walking through a park, that park, as much as it's made by man, the trees represent a scattered woodland. So therefore, think about the sort of birds that would occur in a scattered woodland. And when you think about that, don't be surprised when you see the birds that you think of there. So that's my, my I mean, I can give you many stories, but that's how, what I mean by seeing the environment as a bird would. I mean, walking down the street with skyscrapers, a lot of those skyscrapers could be interpreted as being cliffs by birds like peregrines. You know, they can sit on the ledge and survey the scene. It's no different to sitting on the ledge of a cliff. You know, you're still looking for pigeons, and the pigeons are still there. Okay, thank you. Um, so, your stated mission is to connect people with the environment through birds. What benefits do people gain from this connection with the environment and with birds, and how do these experiences in nature support conservation efforts generally? I think it's really interesting to see how people react to nature, because I've been sort of in the guise of the urban bird for the last 14 years now, and I've taken people around their local cities, uh, everywhere around the world. and. I love it when I, I look at their faces and I show them something or I hear something and at first they can't see or hear it and then they get onto it and it's like, oh my, I never thought that I'd see something like that here, you know. I remember being in someone's garden in England um, not so long ago and I said, she said to me, can you show me some birds in my garden? I said, fine, let's go out in the garden. And within maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes, we'd seen about 20 different species, including a kingfisher. A kingfisher, she was nowhere near a river. A kingfisher flew past. And I said, this sort of stuff happens all the time. It's just that no one's watching or no one's expecting it. You know, you've got to keep your mind open. And as we said that, a buzzard flew overhead. And she said, oh my, I've never seen, I've never seen a buzzard here before. I've, and I said, well, they're probably breeding here. You just need to look up, you know. So, it's that connection which is great. But the other thing is the fact that it makes people feel good. I mean, this lockdown scenario we had in the UK, for example, was a classic example of how nature really united people. That there was that the social media feeds were awash with images of people showing us the birds and wildlife in their garden, you know, and saying, I've never seen that here before. I'm hearing so many of those now. I've never, you know people were getting really hooked into it and it was helping them to get through really dark times. And as I said earlier, we, we kind of now know the strength of how nature can really alleviate us from situations like depression. And I know from my own experience, I remember just before I was born as the urban birder, um, I was depressed and I didn't even realize that I was depressed until one day um, I was really down. I remember I felt like a, a grey cloud all around me and I remember going to the physio because I had a shoulder injury because of soccer and she said to me, what's the matter with you? Because I was sat, sat and standing in the corner almost and I wanted to cry and she said to me, what's the matter? I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just feel, I don't feel happy. And she, she asked me to go, she gave me the details of a psychiatrist so I went over to the psychiatrist that same day and I remember walking into his office and he didn't even look up, he was writing and he said, okay, what, what's the problem? And I thought, I said to him, you know what? I'm fine. And I, just walked, I walked straight out and I went to see my doctor and he said to me, yes, you have mild depression. He said, um, let me give you these pills. I said, I'm not taking any pills. And he said to me, okay, well, if you're not taking pills, then 
go out and do something that you love even more. So I went out, got my binoculars and went to my local patch. And it was birding that pulled me out of the grey dark days because, you know, the birds, they didn't argue with me. The birds filled my heart with joy when I saw them. I felt great just being out in an open space. And I realized that when I'm out birding, it's not even so much birding, it's a fact that it's a time to cleanse your mind. You've got issues and thoughts that you've accumulated previously, you know, from the day before. You go out birding and it seems like they've become cleansed. You know, you don't even do it consciously. And sometimes you, you have a problem and by the end of your session birding, you have a solution and it's just come to you because it's allowed your mind to relax and your thoughts to relax and you begin to think more clearly and you are in tune and there's nothing else that matters you know you're in that moment and it is like a therapy it's like meditation and that's what I've noticed people are experiencing and I think when I started off my road as the urban birder my whole thing as, a, as you said early stormy was to get people engaged and I was thinking how do I do that because people think of birding particularly in Europe as being the domain of white middle class middle aged men with bellies and beards. Okay, I've got both now, but anyway. Um, so basically, I'm thinking, what do I, you know, how do I do this? And I thought the best way is to make it more attainable, more uh, easily to get involved with. So I tried to sell it as a lifestyle choice up there with yoga and Pilates because it's a way of getting out, getting a bit of exercise, fresh air, being somewhere, even if it's the middle of the city that you don't normally frequent and to allow your mind to open which is the most important thing once your mind opens then you have this opportunity to kind of feel grounded and it makes you just feel so much better so I think people have realized that now and they're really kind of embracing it especially when you realize you don't need to have that knowledge it's all about just being able to get out and have, have the ability to open your mind Okay, yes. I, in fact, aren't they prescribing nature in the UK now as an antidepressant? I read yes. somewhere that That's great. <laughs> museums, That's great. beauty, nature, um, I, I think there is more and more research supporting that and um, beautiful. So one final question for you, David. Um, if, if you could offer the group one piece of advice as they embark on this 21-day journey to immerse themselves in a, in a particular space, what would it be? I think it's the classic thing of finding somewhere that you could love. You know, it could be your yard, it could be a park, it could be some spot that you like going to. Find somewhere that you love and just love it. And when you love it, everything opens up. Because it's all about love at the end of the day. When you love something, it just opens up and everything comes to you. So that's the advice. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your time, your wisdom, your experience here today. Um, this is beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome.